Thank you. It's really great to be here, and I'm very indebted to the chief organizer, the chair of the organizing committee, Sarah Peterson. I really appreciate the opportunity of being here, and thanks a lot for coming. So when um, Sarah asked me to talk about silencing voices, I scratched my head and thought, oh, what is it I can talk about? And I thought I would actually look at the transnational level in Europe, the big picture, the bird's eyes perspective. And I tried to translate to myself this uh, uh, a metaphor, silenced voices. Sh what uh, is it really? I come from Hungary originally. Should I speak about Samizdat, the illegal um, uh, publications in the communist period? Well, that wouldn't really interest uh, most of the people in the 21st century digitally oriented uh, scholars. So what is it really? And I, I gave um, a hard look uh, to this. And this is one slide that kind of documents that thought process. So what is really silenced? What is it um, we can define that, that being endangered on, or under threat or challenged? Is it free speech in Europe or freedom of speech as a principle? Do we uh, encounter a, a new era of censorship? Or is it rather democratic speech? Democratic meaning democratic representation in terms of political pluralism or democratic in terms of social diversity representation? Is it the representation of identities, gender, women, sexual minorities, ethnic diversity? Many of you target with your research those areas. Uh, is it the public sphere, public deliberation, which is under threat? Think of Hungary's propaganda state under Viktor Orban's populist regime, which is kind of a Russified new media system within uh, the European Union. Or is uh, an, from another angle, is it speaking the truth, the tradition of fearless speech uh, that uh, Michael, uh, Michel Foucault uh, uh, addressed in his last uh, lecture series, going back to uh, the antique Greek tradition of Antigone, speaking the truth against a power to the face of power, which actually I, go, I think goes back to an earlier tradition of Jewish prophets in the uh, Jewish Christian uh, tradition of Europe. Or is perhaps quality journalism which is under uh, threat by fundi facing funding problems, social media, fake news, post-truth, political uh, bifurcation, dichotomization of publics and the media? Or which level should we target? Local, regional, national, transnational, European, global trends, uh, perhaps geopolitical implications of silencing? And uh, just speaking about silencing is one aspect, but actually, who is it who wants to silence? Who are, I want to see names and pointing fingers of who the bad guys are. So this is, this is the kind of thought process uh, that um, I entertained myself with uh, before coming here. <coughs> So what I would like to talk about is three conceptualizations of silencing democratic communication in, in Europe. And once again, this is a macro level approach, looking at the EU level, global actors impact, even geopolitical approaches. So what follows here is an invention, uh, sorry, an inventory of challenges, risks, and threats. And those who uh, focus on the synergy of uh, these threats. So what I'm going to talk about is three conceptualizations. One is looking at the EU as a fragmented public sphere segmented by 27 nation states media systems. So basically what we witness here or hear or don't hear is silencing of the voice of Europe, the voice of the EU within those 27 national media systems. The second conceptualization I'd like to talk about is threats to media freedom of, of, and pluralism and whether we can actually measure shades of these threats. So it's not we have media freedom and pluralism or we don't, but actually what are the shades of gray and how can we perhaps develop indicators, even measurable empirical indicators to measure those. And the third issue is the question of who. Who is it who wants to silence voices and why in terms of domestic and international <laughs> transnational actors? And now from my screen, everything disappeared, all the text disappeared. So I respectfully request some technical colleague to come and help me out because there is nothing on my screen. So i rather come here and read the slides from here. <laughs> um, so fragmentation of the EU public sphere is the first conceptualization I would like to address here. 
a, you don't have to be a, a European federalist, a Euro federalist to take that angle. Rather, we can just register the fact that the European public sphere is segmented into 27 national public spheres after Brexit, actually, because it used to be 28. But hopefully, at one point, it's going to be 28 again. <laughs> 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 so, 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 right? so it's a very timely to speak about that in, in Scotland. Thank you, Samza. So what we witness here is the lack of a significant pan-European media. Are you familiar with Euro news? the TV channel. Who is familiar with Euronews and who watches Euronews? <laughs> Three out of the hundred four. Sorry. So it's very marginal because that's the only pan-European media and actually it's abandoned by the European Commission. Now it's owned by an Egyptian businessman. So the EU doesn't really care about uh, creating or su even supporting financially pan-European media. Another uh, attempt is Arte, the German, uh, French, uh, uh, TV channel. Who watches it regularly? Four. Regularly. One. Who used to... Uh, so these are marginal. We don't know any time European newspapers. So the point is that 27 national media system, systems filter European discourses and uh, banal nationalism uh, in terms of uh, Michael Billig's uh, expression dominates these national media systems. So it's national agendas, frames that dominate, for example, the discussion of sanctions against Russia as we speak uh, in 2022. 20, uh, Clearly there is a discrepancy or tension between the European public's, uh, public sphere and uh, the lack of U a European media infrastructure. The European narrative is filtered through by the national media systems. And this may be a fertile ground for further exits, like Huxit or Polixit or, or others. Uh, presently, I live in Denmark. And if you ask public opinion polls, well, it's pretty uh, equal. If there was a very referendum today, there is a chance that Denmark could uh, exit, but of course uh, the political elites don't want such a referendum, so there is a risk. So silencing, at least weakening the voice of the EU, of the European voice, the voice of the European Parliament in terms of actors, the European Commission, is what we are witnessing here. But think of entertainment uh, media, think of uh, film and TV productions. There are over 300 dispersed marginal streaming platforms in Europe. If someone in Shanghai or Melbourne wants to watch a, an Italian or Spanish or Czech film, where should they go? There is no European equivalent of, of Netflix. How could Europe stand up for the global audience to compete with American uh, streaming platforms? Uh, although there is, a, a, in principle, a European common market, in fact, what we have is a very fragmented national system of television and film markets. No global competitor, no U European competitor to US platforms. So basically, that's the first conceptualization I would like to offer as food of thought to, in terms of uh, silencing or weakening uh, voices in Europe. The second one I would like to discuss uh, is whether we can measure silencing voices. How could we do that? And here uh, I would like to introduce a project called the European Media Pluralism Monitor that I've been working uh, in uh, around 2007, 2008 and that created a, a complex measurement mechanism with over now 200 indicators uh, that produce national reports uh, annually at the European Union Institute in Florence uh, these days. Uh, there is no time to read everything on the slide, so uh, I would just to highlight that this uh, Media Pluralism Monitor has five key areas, fundamental protection of media freedom and pluralism, market pluralism, political independence of media, social inclusiveness of media, pluralism in the online environment. And there are lots of specific indicators within each of these five uh, areas adding up uh, 200 altogether, and the e, uh, European University Institute 
staff, a country team, and an expert group creates annual reports for each nation state, uh, member state of the European Union and other uh, candidate uh, states. The regular measure since 2020, uh, 2013 and uh, annual reports in the last five years. And the report is uh, concluding that none of the countries analyze this free from risks to media freedom and pluralism. So at this point, I would like to introduce the five baskets, the five uh, groups of indicators very uh, briefly, because that's how we actually measure on the ground in terms of practical empirical data collection and data measurement and assessment uh, in the member states uh, in terms of uh, media pluralism and freedom. So the first area is fundamental protection of media freedom and pluralism, and you see the five particular areas of indicators. And within each indicator group, there are <coughs> indicators. So behind each of these, one, two, three, four, five, there's, there are Excel sheets with the particular indicators asking very specific, empirically testable uh, questions regarding media freedom and pluralism. Actually, there are 57 such empirical indicators in this uh, area of fundamental protection. And the idea is that it's not whether in law or constitutions or media law or access to information law such rights are declared, but actually whether they are implemented and regulatory uh, uh, authorities are held accountable in terms of the implementation of these rights. So it's not, it's not just a legal, but a kind of a legal sociological approach in that area. So there are issues, particular questions like about whistleblower protection, defamation, implementation of those laws and policies. The second uh, area, the second basket is market pluralism. This is a more economy, business oriented set of uh, uh, questions. Transparency of ownership, concentration issues in terms of news media, online platforms, uh, commercial and owner influence over editorial content. Again, al almost 60 indicators are measured annually for each of these uh, 30 something uh, countries at the European uh, University Institute in Firenze. Political independence of media is the third basket with uh, issues, questions regarding editorial autonomy, uh, Elections, very importantly, state regulation of resources and support to the media sector, PSM uh, governance, and funding. The fourth basket has to do with social inclusion, um, and uh, it involves access to media by minorities, access to media for local, regional communities, access to media for women, media literacy, protection against illegal and harmful speech, like character assassination and uh, uh, other issues. And I have a slide more uh, about more details regarding this uh, area because I know this uh, coincides with the research uh, interest of many uh, colleagues in, in, at our conference. The, uh, just to conclude the five baskets, in the last three years, because of the uh, uh, growing in, uh, importance of online uh, communities, New, a new basket was added to the Media Pluralism Monitor regarding online environment and its pluralism. And basically the four areas of questions are repeated in this new added area. So just to recall, uh, all of these 200 questions are asked uh, by expert groups uh, in all of the 30 plus <coughs> countries. And with the NPM, national risks and threat scores are assessed. Uh, in the five areas, low risk is uh, uh, indicated with green between 0 and 33 percent, medium risk is yellow, and high risk is red. And the national reports are narratives, like 30, 40 pages annual uh, small booklets, uh, giving evidence and references to academic literature and policy literature. So the example I, I would uh, pick here is probably the worst case scenario where the level of freedom of uh, media is the worst in Europe. Uh, freedom House actually has, the, has labeled uh, Hungary's uh, media freedom as not free, the only country in the European Union. So I picked this. And these are the 
values for the 2022 report, actually with data from 2021 uh, by the European, European Institute. It's a 45 pages uh, booklet and clearly high risk areas are market pluralism and political independence and uh, medium risk in the two other areas. So these are some details uh, and just to illustrate how it looks like when we look at the report. Social inclusiveness has to do, uh, I picked uh, four particular indicators, access to media for local and regional communities, access to media for women, media literacy, and protection against illegal and harmful speech. So these are some quotes from the actual report. You can find uh, these reports online if you uh, Google MPM University, uh, European Uni University Institute Florence. Uh, you'll find all 30 plus national reports uh, annually online. I'm sorry to be so quick. The I'm uh, under the pressure. Yeah. This show must. It's so tight today that we have the, the, to uh, the, ask some questions. The, the, so I'll, I'll hold this up for a few minutes. Yeah, we'll thank you. Progress. The show must go on. Um, and there are also recommendations. Uh, oftentimes, these are you know uh, <coughs> benevolent uh, recommendations by experts, academics, scholars. But uh, uh, governments like Viktor Orban's authoritarian government couldn't care less. So these are like wishful thinking kind of policy uh, uh, recommendations. And here are some uh, fact uh, uh, finding uh, um, statements and uh, recommendations from the Hungarian report uh, this year. So uh, I would like to conclude this second uh, area of um, how we can think about sciencing. So the proposal is we can actually break it down to empirically measurable, testable, uh, data-driven variables and indicators. The whole idea of sciencing reformulated in terms of media pluralism and freedom, reformulated in five areas, once again broken down uh, and uh, brought down to empirically measurable uh, very specific indicators and uh, expert groups, like actually Freedom House uh, uh, Democracy and, and media expert groups would evaluate Reporters Without Frontiers uh, measure and uh, groups would evaluate uh, media freedom in uh, the particular countries uh, at case. I'm, I, as I prepared this talk, actually, uh, a new idea came to my mind, so I share it with you. It would be very interesting to do longitudinal uh, comparisons with Freedom House uh, data, uh, media indexes, and reporters without frontiers assessments. How this MPM and the two other more established uh, long durée kind of uh, measurements fit or do not fit, and that actually also gives a kind of a reality check or a quality check for this measure. So the original, uh, if someone is interested, the original MPM is uh, published uh, here in two volumes. It's also online in this uh, MPM pages. And I put a, a journal article in the uh, Journal of Media Law in the middle. And finally, we uh, brought out uh, a book on global trends of media pluralism and diversity with Peggy Walke and Robert Picard and uh, discovers <coughs> countries outside of uh, Europe, including the United States, uh, China, India, so some of you may be interested. So that's the second approach one I was thinking about when talking about silencing voices. Now the third approach would be perhaps uh, less scholarly, at least in terms of this kind of empirical measures, but more direct, asking the question about actors. Who are the actors who want to silence voices, and why? Well, if we look at uh, governments, it seems that uh, with the right-wing populist turn, we also see a turn towards more authoritarian media policies in the world. Think of um, President Trump uh, uh, tirades against media and journalists as intermediates, as opposed to direct communication with his voters in social media on his own platforms now. 
It's a quote from Trump, the press is the enemy of the people. Now that doesn't sound very good in the room of uh, media researchers. <laughs> Clearly there is an affinity between populism and post-truth politics and the affinity for disinformation. What's less discussed in the literature is there's an affinity of populism and actually authoritarian, good old authoritarian media policies. And uh, we talk so much uh, about Trump and Brexit and Italian populism. I'd like to uh, talk a little, little bit about Orban, Viktor Orban's Hungary in the last 12 years. Because I do think that Hungary showcases for the first time in an EU member state what happens when right-wing populism becomes a regime ideology for a long time. And when a right-wing populist uh, regime is, is establishing itself for a long time, for a historical period, what we did not witness in the United, in the United States. So in a way, Hungary could be seen as a successful laboratory of a mature, hegemonic, uh, populist propaganda state that was created by media lawfare, using the law almost like a military instrument, top down, to de-democratize the political system as well as the media system. So it's a hybrid political system where democratic checks and uh, balances have been largely dismantled. So the next uh, two slides actually document who wants to get away with media freedom and pluralism using a pop right wing populist regime in the European Union. Um, answering the question, who is it? Who actually wants to silence voices, democratic communication in Europe? So, what happens? Yes, sir. What happens in uh, Hungary? Well, since 2010, the former public service media institutions that functioned pretty well from the late 90s to 2000, 2010 have been largely transformed into strictly controlled and centralized party state propaganda media. At the same time, the majority of former private commercial media have been also centralized under the control of pro-government oligarchs and became also state controlled media. Russification of the Hungarian media system took place. It doesn't fit anymore any of the Hen and Mancini, like Mediterranean, parallel pluralism, or any of those uh, system schemes. It became an authoritarian media system in which the media system is actually part of the state apparatus, mm -hmm. more or less. So we don't see a, a separate institutional system, only for our uh, mostly marginalized independent media system. Democratic and free media have been largely uh, marginalized and their existence is at the mercy of uh, the regime to keep a facade of democracy for uh, the EU. A vigorous network of pro-regime influencers sponsored by the party state mm -hmm. dominates online communication. The whole public space, including street posters, are dominated by multimedia hate campaigns, like securitization campaigns, othering campaigns, targeting George Soros, uh, gay people, uh, minorities, uh, the Roma minority, uh, the West, Brussels, uh, the evil West, along uh, Kremlin, Moscow-based uh, um, uh, discourses. There's actually a propaganda ministry, literally speaking, in which the government, from which the government feeds centralized messages to the propaganda media. So basically this is uh, what happens uh, when a uh, um, right-wing populist regime establishes itself as a system. Um, and this is almost my last slide, so I, I almost made it. But besides what we, um, right-wing governments. There are other actors who don't particularly mm, prefer or prone of or like uh, democratic speech uh, in Europe. And what I have in mind is transnational, uh, international actors. Clearly, the Kremlin has been uh, uh, involved in strategic disinformation campaigns by propaganda websites, social media campaigns, systematic and troll, targeted troll attacks 
one case is uh, Jessica Arrow, the Finnish uh, journalist case. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. It's well documented in the international press. And Aro herself wrote a book about this. She had been targeted as uh, systematically for years by uh, Kremlin uh, sponsored trolls to the verge of killing herself, uh, actually, with a uh, mental breakdown. Check it out if you're interested. So it's a, a well documented case by a public service media uh, journalist in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, Russian campaigns interfere with elections in Europe, in the United States. They support financially and politically anti-EU right-wing populist and extreme right-wing parties. But Russia <coughs> is only one actor uh, that uh, would uh, like to suppress uh, democratic communication in Europe. We talk less about uh, China because Chinese efforts are less visible and the Chinese government uh, 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 things and acts uh, in the long run. We witness a lot of lesser known soft power measures like media support, uh, journalism uh, support, uh, journalists uh, traveled, uh, taken to visit Beijing. Uh, this kind of soft, uh, long term uh, in, um, impact. Another area where China is active is political pressure to classify documents in where international treaties, where taxpayers' money is used, uh, for example, building infrastructure, pro-China infrastructure. One case at point is the Budapest-Belgrade train um, line, which serves Chinese interests to bring Chinese goods from Greece to Western uh, Europe. The Chinese uh, interest uh, in serving Greek ports uh, to Western Europe, and for example, we don't know how much Hungarian taxpayers pay for this because all this is classified at the mutual interest of the corrupt Hungarian government and the Chinese uh, government. Or think of the NBA uh, censorship case in which um, American basketball, uh, basketball trainers and players express solidarity with democracy uh, movement people in Hong Kong. And the Chinese government immediately acted by free, freezing uh, television rights uh, to the NBA and, ex and wanted to exert global censorship on the, uh, in the global public sphere the same way as they do in the domestic space uh, of uh, China. So there's a, an occasional but very energetic effort of exporting censorship when uh, sensitive issues show up. There are many documented cases in which journalists, um, uh, public figures, politicians, um, ex uh, anthropologists, uh, uh, scientists are um, <coughs> refused visa or actually in New Zealand cases when uh, Chinese agents broke into the offices and computers of uh, critical scholars and interfered with uh, critical activities in many ways. Denying Uyghur forced labor camps the, and the prospect of Chinese acquisition of European media are other worrying uh, trends. But so these two uh, trends uh, show to the growing influence of autocracies in the world and the withdrawal of democracies, as <coughs> Eastern European cases like Poland and Hungary also uh, show. But there are other problems, and as we all know, uh, US-based or Silicon Valley-based um, uh, platforms also have detrimental effects on press freedom and pluralism in Europe and the United States itself uh, in terms of siphoning off huge amounts, actually the majority of advertising revenues from traditional media, print and audiovisual media, and unintentionally weakening quality journalism and, in turn, democratic communication in Europe and all over the world. It's a very different dimension and dynamic from the autocracy's strategic <coughs> censorship and propaganda. <coughs> Nevertheless, if we review global geopolitical um, <coughs> trends, it uh, must be mentioned.
And finally, I would like to mention terrorism, specifically targeting journalists. The massacre of 12 editors and cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo, the editorial community in Paris in 2015, the murdering of film director, a film director in Copenhagen, attack just recently, a few weeks, about, no, a few weeks ago on Salman Rushdie, that creates self-censorship uh, among journalists because of fear of Islam fundamentalist terrorism as opposed to freedom of expression. So this is a, a very um, brief overview of strategic geopolitical uh, trends. So I would like to conclude with some questions. Is it possible to create a unified analytical framework for assessing the challenges to democratic communication in Europe, in which we map, or at least put on the map, some national, European, transnational geopolitical actors and trends? Nothing could be more pressing than this question, because weakening democratic communication equals actually weakening democracy itself, because democratic communication is the hardware, the wire, of uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. We witness authoritarian threats and the global wave of authoritarianism, especially th since 2008. These challenges are not particular and unique in terms of Europe. But now we talk about Europe, and it's important to mention that Europe is actually exposed differently in terms of its regions. There are certain regions, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, the Balkans, Southern Europe, Italy, and uh, Portugal and Spain, and the Baltic states that are particularly vulnerable, and the risks are even greater there. Finally, I would like to uh, finish this with a note on the actual potential and potential synergy of these challenges. These challenges come from very different dimensions, but Im the impact is detrimental on democratic communication in Europe. And perhaps uh, we could discuss a synergy of responses, whether this is uh, possible in defense of democratic uh, communication in Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs>